Three weeks ago, al-Qaeda fighters launched a bold, deadly attack on a gas processing plant in North Africa and killed 37 foreign workers. Survivors said the assault was well-planned and well-executed, though details about the identities and motives of the invaders remain murky. The attack is evidence that the threat from al-Qaeda is still potent, and the group's goal remains the same, to attack Americans and other Westerners wherever they may be, even on a barren patch of the Sahara Desert. There were eight Americans at the Algerian gas plant when the terrorists struck. Three died, five survived. Tonight, you'll hear for the first time from three of them. The story will continue in a moment. I was 100% sure I was going to die. So each of you thought you were going to die? Yes, absolutely certain. There was no doubt in my mind that a lot of people were going to die through this event. The event, a three-pronged attack, unfolded before dawn on Wednesday, January 16th. 32 al-Qaeda fighters stormed the sprawling natural gas field. They sprayed buildings and vehicles with automatic weapons and launched rocket-propelled grenades. These three men, Nick Frazier, Mark Cobb, and Steve Wasaki, all worked for the oil company BP, all witnessed the simultaneous assaults. They showed us where they were on a satellite photo of the gas field. My office was approximately right there. Wasaki, an oil and gas well expert, was at the main production plant in a small office building. I was actually located in this building right here. Cobb, BP's manager at the facility, was in his office near the residential camp, home to 800 workers, mostly Algerians. Frazier, a petroleum engineer, was on a bus bound for a nearby town. It had just pulled out of the main gate. Uh, I heard something, and my initial reaction was, oh no, we've blown a tire. It sounded like a blown tire. Yeah. Then I looked out the, the left-hand window, and I saw dozens and dozens and dozens of red streaks past the, uh, past the left-hand side of the bus. And then... Uh, you were under attack. Yes. People started to scramble, and then uh, bullets started to come through the front windshield. And everyone was, uh, as fast as they could, getting to where they could lay down in the, the walkway of the seats and get as flat as possible. I don't know. Everyone was so calm. You just you become so calm. It wasn't how I thought I would re have reacted at all. No screaming, no... It was very silent, very organized. It was as if we had trained for it, but we hadn't. You could hear bullets uh, starting to hit the, the side of the bus. And it wasn't one, two, or three bullets. It was, it was hundreds. It was uh, just bam, 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 just constant on the side of the bus. I texted my wife, bus is under attack. Call the embassy. This is real. Uh, do not call me. You have to be wanting to tell her, if I don't get back, I want you to know everything I feel. I, I didn't do that. Uh, and part of it might be because I didn't want to give up hope. And another, because I didn't want her to think that I was going to die. So I think between those two reasons, I, I'd never really said goodbye. Algerian soldiers came to the rescue from a nearby base and battled the militants for three hours. They saved our lives. They uh, returned fire, heavy, heavy, heavy uh, gunfire. They stood by the bus and, and shot back and kept the terrorists from getting onto the bus, which is, I'm assuming, is their intent. Finally, the soldiers took Frazier and the others on the bus to safety. For Nick Frazier, the terror was over. But here at this Spartan work camp where Mark Cobb lived and worked, a second group of al-Qaeda fighters had seized control. My first reaction was to uh, call my boss in London. What and, was the message? Uh, my message to him was very simple. Uh, we're under a major terrorist attack. You uh, felt it at that moment? Oh, it was clear. The amount of gunfire was clear. I mean, it, uh, you know, I, I, I was guessing I was hearing gunfire involving probably 20 plus individuals trading fire. Mm. It was that kind of intensity. By that point in time, I could hear very clearly gunfire inside the camp itself. 
So I knew the camp had been attacked. And I was looking out the window myself, and I saw three terrorists in the parking lot. And uh, that's at the point in time where I realized I needed to hide. Had it occurred to you by this time, I'm an American, an expat. I'm a manager here. Maybe they're coming for me. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I knew as the, uh, the highest ranking American on the site, I would be a prize. They put the highest value on American hostages, British hostages, and French hostages. Cobb gathered his staff in one room and locked the door. He crouched behind a filing cabinet as his co-workers hit him. Sat in a small ball in the corner and they took all the maps and they laid them over the top of my head and they stacked the maps in front where the small gap was between the metal cabinets and uh, basically, uh, basically hit me. Did you feel safe? No. If they started poking at the maps with an AK-47 or peeling maps off the top, top of me, I knew it was over with, yeah. I heard them uh, kick open the front door. That's, I guess, at the point where, in all honesty, I would say I felt pure terror. I, I felt that uh, I was going to be taken. So at that point, I, I elected to begin to make my calls to my family and uh, say my goodbyes. Who did I, you call? I called my daughter-in-law. My son uh, works for BP in the Gulf of Mexico. He was on a rig. He was on shift. Um, so I called her. I what told did you her, say? I told her that I loved her. I told her that I loved my grandbaby. Uh, I told her to please get a hold of my son um, and to tell him that, uh, you know, I couldn't ever ask for a better son. And my cell phone buzzed. I didn't look down. It was my son calling me. He called me back, very emotional, um, asked me, was it really that bad? And I said, yeah, it was, son. I said, I'm not You're sure. You're whispering. I'm, yeah, I'm whispering. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. And uh, I told him I had to get off the phone because then they were kicking the doors in closer to where I was, uh, the room I was hiding in, and I hung up the phone with him. Can you hear your heart beat in a moment like this? Oh, yeah. Especially sitting in that corner, dead still. You know, you don't even want to breathe deeply because it might rustle the paper on top of you. And what are you hearing? I'm hearing the distinct sound of uh, a boot going into a door. But by the grace of God, there was only two doors they didn't kick into that office building. And one of those two was the door I was behind. Why do you think that's true? I have no idea. I have no idea why they didn't kick that door in. After hiding for several hours, Cobb decided to risk an escape. He scurried to the perimeter fence, dove through a hole, and ran for his life across the desert to the Algerian military base a half mile away. Both Cobb and Frazier got out. Cobb's friend, fellow Texan Victor Lovelady, was not so lucky. He was taken hostage at the camp where Cobb was hiding. At the massive gas plant up the road, a third group of Al-Qaeda terrorists marauded through the giant maze of pipes and machinery looking for more hostages. We started hearing voices on our radios that didn't belong on our radios. The terrorists had, quote, they had captured some of our radios, if you will, or taken them away from people, and they were starting to use our radios to communicate with themselves. And I looked out the front door, and I saw a man that didn't belong there starting to come up the steps, wearing camouflage fatigues, and I took off running. and. One of the guys literally grabbed me and threw me under my desk in my hole. And, and then everybody got very quiet. Steve Wasaki was curled into the corner of his cubicle. On the other side of the wall, another American, Gordon Rowan, took shelter in a bare conference room. Intruders searched the building, kicking down doors. I was laying there trying to be just absolutely as quiet and as still as I could. My greatest fear was I would sneeze or would move a boot or something like that and make a sound. I heard an exchange which I didn't fully recognize at first and then the response to the question was, my name is Gordon, I'm an American. And I knew Gordon had been captured. And the response from the terrorist was, uh, you are welcome then. In English, well, we've got you now. Gordon was Gordon Rowan, Wasaki and Frazier's boss, 
and one of the most senior engineers in the gas field, and he was in the hands of the terrorist. I was wearing my boots, and every time you touched, it seemed like you touched the side of this little com compartment I was in, it sounded like a drum, and it scared me. I was just afraid to move. But After two nights in hiding, Wasaki and a few others made a break for freedom. And we found that there's a spot in the fence that was uh, damaged that we could go through. We got through the fence, and we continued across the, um, the open desert. There was this speculation that perhaps a motivation was to go in there, and they wanted to know how the process worked and how the plants worked, because they wanted to create a huge explosion to get attention. I don't think they understood technically how the plant they operated. They being the terrorist. The terrorist. But I think they understood enough to know that if there was high pressure gas in there and they put bombs in the right places, that they could create a what huge we, explosion. A huge explosion. A spectacular, as, uh, as it's sometimes referred to in, in security parlance. So, Seen around the world and from this highest point in the sky. Absolutely. The plant had shut down at the first sound of trouble. The terrorist apparently unable to restart it. But they did detonate a bomb, a vehicle packed with explosives. It killed most of them and seven of their hostages, including Gordon Rowan. Two other Americans also died. Fred Bataccio suffered a fatal heart attack at the start of the four-day siege. Cobb's friend, Victor Lovelady, was killed a day later, along with several other hostages. The terrorists were trying to move key hostages from the camp to the plant. Algerian helicopters obliterated the convoy, leaving the vehicle in which they were captive, charred and twisted. After four days, it was over. Survivors and friends gathered for Gordon Rowan's funeral a week ago. People died. Friends of yours died, you know. Do you feel their butt for the grace of God, their butt, you know, why me? How did I survive and someone else didn't? You can't help but ask that question. Why was I able to escape? You know, why was Nick not shot on that bus? I don't know. I don't think any of us know. When I heard the guys in our building get taken, I'm like, why couldn't I have done something to help? And I guilt, feel guilty for being, feeling that I was paralyzed with fear and not do anything. But. And I'm especially guilty because they lost their lives, and I didn't. All of us got uh, quite a bit of time ahead of us to go through this and relive these memories and the nightmares that we have at night and the sleepless nights that nightmares. we have. Nightmares? Nightmares? Yeah. The nightmares for me are all the same thing. It's the sound of those footsteps as they came down that hallway towards that door. Coming for you. Coming for me.